So now multiple dispatch is really like the thing that Julia is all about. If you know anything about the language, that's the first thing to know. Um, and then another thing that it's all about is like aggressive compilation, you know, so take the types of arguments of functions and like aggressively specialize on that and sacrifice compiler time to get performance. Um, and of course, you know, this is one of the things we still, we've, we've made great strides, but we still struggle with it, right? People have issues with startup time and package load time. The, f the flip side of that is that you get in incredible performance, right? So, um, but apparently already in 2009, we thought that this was a reasonable price. Um, so, you know, at some point we had Jeff, I don't know what he was doing, but it was April 1st, so maybe I was joking, but we were really, really into whatever he was doing, a lot of commits that day. Um, and then in 2012, there was a blog post that I wrote while I was on vacation in in Buenos Aires. I was hanging out, and I think you have to be relaxed to write a really good blog post, maybe. I don't know. Um, so I wrote this blog post that was really like, you know, a call to action, a real inspiring thing. And uh, so overall posted it on Reddit, um, which would have been fine, except <laughs> I had no idea he was going to post it on Reddit. Um, and Jeff also thought, you know, maybe did we even finish editing this thing? And the, I think one of the funniest things in there, seeing, looking back on it, is that we do mention that it is time for a 1.0 release, which is amusing. Like six years later, we finally release 1.0. I would have maybe edited that out. Um, this is a snippet of the blog post. Um, basically, we're greedy. We want all of the good things of all of these different programming languages. And people are, people are pretty familiar with this blog post at this point. Um, it was, we published it on, the, on Valentine's Day 2012, but uh, it didn't pick up on Reddit until a few days later. And that caused a huge spike of page views. Um, and that was, that was really exciting. I mean, this was like the beginning of a pretty crazy roller coaster ride for us. Um, and it was, it's, it's, it was a strange transition because before that you have this hobby that you're, you're very serious about and you spent a lot of time and energy on and took it really seriously, but you kind of have this feeling like this is never going anywhere. Like no one's really going to ever care about this. And then overnight you find out, oh, there are people who think the same way and feel the same way and are excited about this. Um, and that, that, you know, that's a trans transformative thing. Um, so, you know, in, in, around that time, I'm, it wasn't really a release because it was a pre-release version, but I'm going to call it Julia 0.0, .0 you know, whatever, what we had when we announced it uh, was, you know, within two, two X of speed of C. So that was like a pretty big selling point. That was one of the things that made people be like, oh, hey, this is kind of interesting. It's a dynamic language. It's pretty high level, but it like runs really fast. Um, and that was accomplished with JIT compilation and LVM, which is a great compiler tool chain. Um, we had pretty simple distributed computing from the beginning, which also got people interested. And uh, I think a thing you really need to get people to try your programming language is a very complete manual. So I spent a couple months writing that, and that was well worth it. Um, about a year later, we released 0 0.1. Um, key, key features, namespaces, and modules, uh, support for Windows for the first time. Um, and a package manager, because there was a while, it's interesting if you look at the Git history of the project, there was a while we were just checking packages into the contrib directory, and that started ballooning and getting really, really huge, and there was a lot of very weird stuff in, in the repository, and at some point I was like, we gotta get this out of the repository, and so I wrote a package manager. Um, and sometime after that, that release, uh, so Fernando Perez of Jupyter and IPython fame uh, sent us an email. He had actually been pretty, you know, he and Brian Granger had been pretty active on our Julia Dev mailing list. Um, and we didn't really know who they were if, at first, but we were like, oh yeah, this, this, you know, this, your project is cool. It would be really cool to have some sort of integration. Um, but, you know, he sent this email and he very generously, he made this happen. And he's a guy who makes things happen. Um, he made, he con contacted, uh, Jeff and I, uh, Veral was in India at the time, so it was a little bit less convenient for him to come, or he, I'm sure he would have come. And Steve Johnson, who is the author of FFTW, which is a pretty amazing piece of software. Uh, and he was at MIT, and we all went. We hacked for a week, and we, in a week, Matthias was there. We had the, uh, the first non-Python kernel for what is now known as Jupyter working, and it was exciting. It was, it was a really cool week. It was a really fun time, too. Um, and that was the beginning of now, you know, there are what, like, 60 programming languages you can use from the Jupyter Notebook. 
more than a hundred. That's crazy. So this was this was the first non Python one. So that's this is where it all started. We wouldn't we wouldn't be here if not for this one week. Um, and so a bit after that, a few months after that, we released Julia 0.2 with some exciting exciting features. Um, probably the most exciting one was actually the fact that we had Jupyter Notebook support. Um, that was that you know that changed the way people interact with the programming language uh, in in a pretty profound way. Um, 0.3 was kind of a boring release. It was like you know when Apple does Snow Leopard or whatever, and they just do like quality and stability. Um, 0.4. This was a this had a lot of good stuff. So you know, compile time was an issue. So we had pre-compiled modules. So now instead of compiling all the code when you load something, you can remember what you did the last time and save time. Um, generated functions, which is a pretty powerful uh, feature for you know doing doing you know high performance computing. You can actually like hook into the type system before generating code, and it it's very very fancy. Uh, generational GC, which is hugely important for performance, and then doc strings, because you know everybody loves to actually know what some code does. Uh, and this is you know very similar to how Python does things. 0.5, the great function overhaul. And I think this is actually one of the things that makes modern Julia what it is. It is the fact that you can use higher order programming. You can you know write functions that take functions and then do something generic with a function that was passed from the user, and it has zero overhead. It has the exact same performance as what you would write if you like hand inlined the exact operation that you passed. And the the difference before and after this is night and day, right? Before this, we were doing all sorts of hacky things to try to get that sort of performance where what we really wanted was, you know, just a function that takes a function. And then, but without sacrificing performance. And so this was like really, I think, the, the birth of modern Julia. Um, and a, a, a thing that has been very, very successful that came along with this was the dot syntax for broadcasting. So if you're familiar with MATLAB, if you write A dot plus B, it you know does vectorized addition. Um, we made that a syntax thing and actually made it so that if you have lots of arguments, it doesn't create temporaries. It does the whole thing in one shot, and that's been really successful. Uh, we added multi-threading for the first time, uh, and we got to 85% test coverage, which you know it had been maybe 10% the release before that. So this was a huge push. Um, the next release got the great type system overhaul, um, which is a little bit less exciting uh, to most people than the function overhaul, but it really made things sane in terms of how the type system works. And it's, it's interesting because Julia is, you know, it's rare for a dynamic language to have such an explicit type system that you can work with and do things interesting with. And this is when it really became, I think, mature and came into its own. Um, near and dear to my heart, I worked on strings. Previous to this, we had a weird menagerie of interesting string types that seemed like a good idea at the time. This was when I basically said, look, you know, modern computing, you really mostly need UTF-8. You can have packages for other stuff, but let's just like double down on UTF-8. Um, I'm not going to get into the infamous number, bug number 265, but this was, there was much rejoicing when this was fixed. Um, so 1.0, this is where we are today. We released this a couple weeks ago at, uh, at JuliaCon in London, uh, and it has a ton of interesting and exciting features, and it was, man, it is the most, thing, most work I've ever done on anything in my entire life, and I think that is true not just for me, but also for like dozens of other people who contributed. So the amount of you know, person hours that went into it is really extraordinary. Um, official, efficient, simple, missing data support. So this is a huge deal. Veral's going to show uh, details about this later, but this really makes Julia a first-class language for data analysis now. Um, strings. Uh, if anybody has ever been doing string processing or had some like long-running job, and then suddenly you know days or hours into it, you get a like invalid Unicode bug, and then your whole thing crashes. You know that sucks. It is really, really not okay. So now, Julia strings don't do that ever. If you get invalid data, it just takes the invalid data. You can check that it's invalid or valid, but it won't crash. 
Um, name tuples, I think those are probably familiar to people because Python has them as well. They're pretty handy for data analysis as well because you can represent the row of a table in the same way, in the way you'd like to and access its fields in an efficient way by name instead of, you know, the third row element of the row is not as interesting as like, you know, the row called last name or whatever. Um, these are a little bit lower level, but we have a new package manager. I think actually the package management story in Julia is now pretty much second. Second, I don't, I, I, I took inspiration from all of the best package managers and tried to do at least as well as them. So we looked at Cargo, we looked at Virtual End, we looked at Bundler, um, and I think, you know, it seems to be working out. People are pretty happy with this. Uh, New optimizer. The main thing about that is that it's uh, it's really fast, which you know a lot of a lot of applications have gotten a, like 20 to 30 percent lift for free from just upgrading to 1.0. Um, and of course, the big feature is API stability, right? Like now, code that works in 1.0 will work in 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, until a few years from now, whenever we get around to it, we'll get to 2.0 and break some stuff. Hopefully, hopefully, we'll break stuff in the good direction. Um, so this was a this was a big spike. It's actually a, a, interestingly a similar profile uh, to the uh, to the the you know announcement blog post spike. But I think the interesting thing is that the tail is much longer. So we've got a lot more longevity here in terms of like this interest seems to be sticking, and you know GitHub stars have just gone through the roof. Um, so enough talk about history. Let me show you a little bit of Julia. So this will be familiar but fun to people who are familiar with Julia and, you know, hopefully informative to people who are not familiar with Julia. So we're going to do, you know, this is not what the, the, the language is named after, but the Julia set is a fun thing to explore. So we're going to define, you know, this little function that computes the Julia set. And the way it works is pretty straightforward. You, you do this, you iterate this line here z equals z squared, and we could just as easily write, um, that, uh, so z squared plus c, uh, and you, you have a maximum number of iterations and you basically see, you know, does this escape, does this go out farther than a radius of two? Um, and if it goes further than a radius of two, you consider it to have escaped, otherwise it doesn't escape. Um, and this creates pretty patterns, which is, of interest. So we can compute one and we can see this goes, this escapes to, you know, 70, uh, it goes 70 iterations, that goes 50 iterations, that goes 48 iterations. So you get different numbers here depending on what the inputs are. Um, it, so Julia is generic, right? So this, uh, you know, we can put all sorts of type ver values in here. So that actually, you know, the result is always a number of iterations, so it's an integer, but it doesn't care if you put integers or floating point numbers or complex numbers in. Um, you know, of course, uh, you know, if you do something like this, that's not going to work because you can't take the absolute, this absolute squared value of a string. We just don't know how to do that. Um, so the, the real interest is when you start making pictures of these. Um, and now this is going to be like the worst visualization of a Julia set ever. It's just a bunch of numbers. Um, but you know, technically this is a log scale plot, right? Uh, just by the number of digits. You can see the interesting stuff is in the lower left and upper right. Um, what, what's also interesting though is the efficiency of wi with which this is computed and also how easy it is to see how it's computed. So this is the native code that's run here and you can see that it's, uh, it's just a handful of vector instructions and it uses the you know, fancy vectorized instructions that modern machines have that make them so fast. Um, so this computes really quickly. If you happen to actually pass it integers, it can do it even more efficiently for integers. So Julia generates code that's specialized for the arguments you pass it, and that's one of its secret sauces to, to be high, high performance. All right, so we're going to load a few packages, colors for working with colors, images for working with images, and then some other things for displaying them. Um, uh, so I'm going to generate a color map. So this is, you know, red to blue, uh, and we pick a hundred swatches and you can see that one of the nice things about working in the Jupyter notebook environment is that you get this HTML display and you have an object. This object is actually just a, you know, if you see the, the type here, it is just a, an array of these uh, RGB objects. 
uh, and the RGB has three components, and what these are, they're fixed point numbers. Um, so the nice thing is that this is the native representation that the machine uses for colors, but it's connected but through the type system to present it to the user in a way that's like really nice and easy to work with. Um, so you get the efficiency combined with the behavior that you really want. Uh, and you can pull out an individual pixel, and in the notebook it displays nicely. Um, you can also look at the contents, and you can see that this thing is just a thing with three fields, RGB. Um, you can pull out one of them, and you can see it's got this funny notation, but it's really but approximately the value 0 0.63. Um, but actually, the way that's represented is that it is actually represented as uh, internally as a UNT, number, the UNT unsigned integer value 118. And that's somewhere between 255, and that's how you figure out what it, what it represents. Um, operations on these guys are very efficient. Uh, and you can do you know, all the normal arithmetic. But what it's actually doing under the hood is just integer operations, not floating point operations. So that's actually really, really efficient, both in terms of storage and operation without sacrificing uh, convenience. You can also take a look at uh, how this is implemented, and you can actually click on the click on the on the link and it takes you to the implementation of that addition object in on GitHub at the commit that you're currently running, which is kind of I, this is one of the things I love about running in the Jupyter notebook and using Julia. Um, okay, so let's actually do a decent visualization. Uh, and so what you do here is you, you call this, this Julia function and you iterate over you know, the real and the imaginary value of the Z value uh, for a fixed C value, which is just this you know, negative 0 0.5 plus 0.6 imaginary. Um, and you create a two-dimensional array of that and then you wrap it in an image tag and then you just display it. Um, one of the fun things about these guys is that you can do you know, you can change this a little bit and you get a different image. Uh, so sometimes quite different, like it's, it's kind of cool how, how different these things look. Um, th these are all quite what are called Julia sets. Um, they're related to the Mandelbrot set in that the Mandelbrot set is the diagonal of all of these through this multi-dimensional space. So if, if instead of fixing one of the coordinates, we use the same, uh, the same complex value for both of them when we start this out, then you get the familiar Mandelbrot set. Um, so it's, this is a great application for high performance computing because you know in with Julia because you can see like this was really easy to write, but the output it comes shows up like instantaneously. There's no lag here, um, and this is you know a notebook uh, in a, running on a laptop. It's not a super powerful machine or anything. It's kind of it's. Fun, fun to tweak those numbers, but it's even more fun if you can do it interactively. So there's this great package called Interact, which gives you this uh, macro. So the at sign in Julia is a macro, uh, and it can transform code. You know, it takes the syntax of one thing and transforms it into arbitrary syntax for something else. So in this case, it takes this for loop, and that's the exact same in expression inside. And it's taken a second because it's compiling some code. Um, and it gives you these sliders. And what you can do with the sliders, you can just move them around and you can see all the different, you know, all the different configurations you can get by changing these values of, uh, of R and I. Uh, and they're all, they're all pretty, quite pretty. It's a little bit laggy though. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to improve the performance. Um, so uh, this is a common pattern in Julia. Start out with the sort of simple, straightforward version of something, and then you figure out like, ah, oh, it's a little bit, the performance could be a little bit better here, so like how do we tweak that? In this case, this is allocating a new, new data every single time, allocating a new image every single time, and then rendering it from scratch. So that's kind of inefficient. So what if we just did it all in place? So this makes the, the, the computation a little more complicated, but you know, so we save these ranges as, as values i and r. We allocate the data once, and it's just empty. It's just an empty array. Uh, then we make an image object out of it. And then inside of this, we, we do our manipulate. And what we do is we iterate over all the i, j, k, and r values, and we update the data in place. So there's no allocation here anymore. Now you just, now it's all just scalar operation with no allocation. Um, so it behaves exactly the same, except that instead of allocating, it's a little bit, it's faster. 
so it's less laggy. And you can see, you can see that there's, it's faster, but it's still a little bit laggy. So the question is, can we do even better? Um, and so we're going to use that th multi-threading that I mentioned. Um, so you all you have to do is say using base threads, uh, and then you just have to put this threads macro here. And so what this is going to do is it's going to multi-thread the outer, the J loop. And so now for every, I have, we can see I have eight cores on this machine. Oh, sorry, I have to evaluate this first. Yeah. So I have eight cores on this machine. And so we should get roughly an 8x speed up. And you can see that now, instead of being laggy, it's pretty, it's pretty quick. Um, and so this is, this is a theme of the language, is that you can do the nice, easy thing, and it's pretty fast. But if you really want to get high performance, it's also pretty easy to do that. And you can go as deep as you want. Um, but we try to keep it as easy as possible to, to go deeper. Uh, OK, any questions about this? OK. Do you need users in the audience? Yeah, I, I know there's a few. I, all right. Um, all right, so Viral's going to talk about some stuff and do some demo, do, demoing himself now. All right, thank you. Do you want to just switch? It seems easy enough. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I do need to switch. OK, yeah. So, yeah, hi, I'm Viral, and um, Stefan's given us a nice introduction to the, you know, to Julia here, and where, you know, how we've evolved and how we got here. Oops, um, that thing shouldn't have happened there. So, what I have, I, I, I'm going to talk about a few different things, and... Um, but but before I before I get into that, what I wanted to do was uh, maybe give a quick shout out to Jane, uh, who's our director of diversity at Julia Computing. Um, so maybe you want to say hi. She did the tutorial yesterday, which some of you might have been at. Um, and maybe also shout out to Joseph, who's uh, one of our authors for the Julia plotting packages. So maybe Joseph can say hi. Um, so so it's it's good to see uh, everyone here. Um, I. Uh, I wanted to sort of start out with uh, you know so one of the big um, one of the big sort of things that people did not like about Julia in the early days pre 1.0 was that data frames were slow, and doing any form of data analysis would end up being slow because of the way uh, missing data interacted with the rest of the Julia system um, and especially the type system and the performance that that came out of that. Um, and, and this was sort of nicely articulated in this blog post by John Miles White, um, why Julia data frames are still slow. This was in, you know, about three years ago. And, you know, he basically walks, he gives us a few simple examples that show what's going on. So is this visible at the back? Should I make it a bit bigger? All right. So it's a simple function, uh, you know, which takes in a black box container and then, you know, it's, it's kind of unpacking it and, and basically just, you know, computing a dot product in this for loop and then returning the, the sum, the, the dot product itself. Um, so that's the function G1 here. And then he has G2 here, which does the same thing, but has refactored this loop out, okay? So that's the only difference between the two two versions. So this 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 loop out here in function G1 has been uh, refactored out into this function called hot loop. So G2 is basically doing the same thing, but it's calling this in a in a in a special function. Um, and what he what he points out is that if if you you know if your inputs are these two random vectors that are packed into a container of type any, which means now Julia doesn't actually know what's the type of the stuff inside it until it actually pulls it out and, and runs the type inference passes uh, through it. It, it. it couldn't know that. So he runs, you know, we, we run G1 with this container and uh, it turns out to be slow. Uh, but the version where the, where the hot loop has been refactored out of the function is fast. All right, so if you're a Julia programmer, this would not come as a surprise to you because what happens is the type inference usually runs at uh, call sites. And so the moment you split it out into a function, Julia is able to run type inference out here, and which means it's able to sort of ask the question of what the types of X and Y are, 
and then infer that they're vectors and it works uh, well, you know, it works fast. So all, all good so far. I mean, this is not the reason why data frames are slow, right? So this is, this is just how Julia works. Um, y y you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, you could argue that the compiler could be smarter and do inference even, you know, inside of uh, function bodies, but that's a different topic. The problem is, is here, right? Now let's say that for performance reasons, you want to inline this, this hot loop. So we write a, f a new function uh, out here, a new variant of this function, G3, and, and what John has done in his blog post here is now he's calling the hot loop alternative, which is the same function, but with, uh, you know, with, with inlining. And so G1 is slow, G2 is extremely fast. It's like uh, 100, 200 times faster. Um, but G3 now, because of the inlining, is slow again. So any guesses why? Um, it really inlines it, right. So you lose the inference at the, at the call side there. And this, was, this sort of made it difficult to write high performance data frames code because if you think of a data frame, it's many different vectors, uh, data type, vectors of different data types put into a black box container and then when you, F, uh, you know, when you work with them, you want to sort of be able to pull these things out and effortlessly work on them. Um, a, a lot of the other problems also come from the way missing data was represented and, and how, uh, type inference worked on it, but that's that's not even the issue here. So John talks about you know various uh, solutions to this problem. Um, one was you know can we do something with the Julia compiler to make this better? Second one was a custom data frame uh, type which actually incorporates the type information in the data frame, and then the third solution is a high level API. So this was three years ago. So fast forward three years. Um, all these three have been addressed, actually. So the compiler has been improved to be able to deal with it, and I'm gonna show that in a second. Um, there is actually a new project called JuliaDB, so if you go to juliadb.org, you'll see that um, it, it actually uses an index table which basically uh, has a custom data frame type for every distinct data frame object in the sense that it is parameterized by the types of, uh, you know, all, all the data types in each column that, that are stored in there. Um, and so you pay a compile time penalty for using index tables and JuliaDB, but what you get in return is, is very good performance and an amazing data manipulation um, data structure. Uh, it also works in parallel. Um, it will also get multi-threaded with, with some of the new multi-threading that's coming post 1.0. Um, and you know, the, the way I like to talk about JuliaDB very quickly is that uh, Wes McKinney actually wrote a post pandas 1. Point, like what should pandas 2.0 look like blog post and he identified like 10 things that that you ought to do to make pandas better which maybe pandas 2.0 would address and julia db because of its design with you know because of the way julia is designed and the way the type system and the performance work effectively ends up addressing most of those uh, concerns um, through the design itself um, and then the third, word, the, the third thing out here is the introduction of a high-level API, uh, which is what packages like the Queryverse, uh, Query.jl that David Anthoff has written are, are addressing. And I've, I've converted John's uh, blog post into a notebook. So this is running with Julia 1.0. Uh, it is running in Jupyter with Julia 1.0. So the way I did that is I literally just started, you know, I've downloaded Julia 1.0 out here from the Julia Downloads uh, website, julialang.org slash downloads. Um, you know, I, I added the package, uh, through the package manager, I added the iJulia package, and then I said notebook. I didn't have to, you know, sort of fudge around with which version of Python do I have and what version of Jupyter do I have. Luckily, everything has been sort of, you know, thought through in the package manager and, and, and installed correctly, so. All right, so, so this is the function G1, as you remember, this is the, the one with the loop in the body. This is G2, which is the loop factored out, and this is uh, G3 is right here with the inline version. So as you remember, um, I'm gonna just run this again. So G1 is a bit slow. The, the run times are obviously different because they're different computers. Uh, this is G2, which is about 100, 150 times faster. Uh, which was which was as we would expect, and here's G3. So the inline version of this also runs really fast, um, and that was sort of 
you know, while it looks like a small change, that was a major part of the new compiler, the new optimizer that Stefan just referred to. Um, um, and all the treatment of missing data and, and everything just kind of just goes, goes through there uh, very well. Um, all right. Um, so so this, is, this is where the Julia data ecosystem is now stabilizing. The data frames package in Julia has been upgraded to Julia 1.0. It works really well. Julia DB is almost ready to work on 1.0. We released Julia 1.0 about uh, three or four weeks ago, so the package ecosystem is still getting upgraded. We are now at about 450 out of Julia's 2000 packages already working on Julia 1.0. Um, one of the key packages in Julia that I like to talk about is, is the jump package or the jump ecosystem, which, is, which I feel is something that's special about Julia that you don't see in Python and R. Everything I've seen talked about so far is, is something that you might you know, have worked with uh, if you're a Python or an R user. Um, and, and without uh, going into the jump website details, um, has, has everyone here heard about, like I'm guessing not all of you are Julia users, so maybe I should say a couple more lines about it. Have you folks heard about Jump at all? Um, so, except for Jane, of course. Um, so, so, so one of the good things about Julia packages is that you can find them by just putting the .jl suffix on them and searching them on Google, and it usually turns up as the first hit. So Jump is actually an optimization framework uh, for doing uh, a large number of um, you know linear programming, mixed integer linear programming, um, and and sort of you know uh, all, all this conic, semi-definite, non-linear programming, a, a whole variety of, of of optimization problems. And what it actually does is it uses Julia's meta programming to provide you a specification language to describe the problem without knowing the details of the solver or the math underneath it, and then you just hit the solve button and it will call. Uh, solver, whether it's you know a commercial solver or an open source solver, whichever one you might have, and solve the problem for you. Okay, so it, it's it's a really cool story, and um, the reason I bring up Jump today is uh, we we learned about this amazing uh, you know solution to uh, the Boston school bus uh, public uh, the the Boston public school uh, school bus routing problem. So. This was something that was costing Boston schools $120 million just running school buses, taking kids you know, from home to school and back. Um, and they put out a challenge uh, at, at one point for optimizing these bus routes and there was a team from MIT. So a lot of the work on Jump and Julia, so while Julia had a group at MIT that was working on it in the math department driven by Professor Alan Edelman, the optimization work comes out of the Sloan manage, you know, the business school at MIT. Um, and a team from there actually participated in, the, in this challenge and won the challenge. So the savings uh, were about $5 million right here. So between three and $5 million. Uh, and, and the way it was done was that they, they consumed all the data, they you know, replanned out all the routes and then came up with new routes for the students so the order in which the students might be, it's, it basically boils down to a traveling salesman problem. And if by solving it better, you get better bus routes uh, for the students uh, or for the school system as a whole, not necessarily for all the students. Um, some of them might have longer transit times. Some of them will have shorter transit times because of the optimization. But overall, the system is fairer in general because you can, you know, when you, when you put, when you put the math in and when you put the optimizer in, what happens is you can put fairness constraints. So the requirement, I think, in Boston is that no more than one hour of, of transit time for every student. Uh, but some might have had a five-minute drive, uh, you know, and some might have had a 45-minute drive. Um, great, it was done. You know, you, you know, $5 million saved, uh, ca you know, lesser carbon dioxide uh, emitted, all that good stuff. We had, uh, I, I just learned recently that there were parents picketing the algorithm um, in, you know, against the administration uh, after this was implemented. So guess what? The guy, the, the parents whose kids now had a slightly longer journey, even though it was better overall for the system, were very unhappy. It also turned out apparently, and this is a bit anecdotal, that the better off neighborhoods uh, were the ones that saw increase in times and the poorer neighborhoods saw decrease in times. And uh, it, this is this is this is data science at work, right? I mean, these are large questions that that you know we all strive to you know 
solve and address and answer with data and algorithms. And this was a great story. Um, this was uh, so. This is this is uh, this was actually featured in the Wall Street Journal. The I think it's going to be in the Boston Globe next month. Um, and we're just trying to make sure that this, one of the things we do at Julia Computing is make sure that applications like this can be easily built, developed, and deployed for non-Julia users to use. So the next step that we are looking forward to is, is seeing, can we put this on a web server? Can we get more schools to use it? Can it go beyond Boston? Can it go countrywide? Um, you know, and, and, and all that good stuff. So. You know, while this is a, a great case study, I thought that would be that would be fun for you guys. There's many other case studies um, for people. You know, about I think a lot of you guys would find blog posts and see how Julia is being used by the community. You know, uh, there's a huge amount of people who are who are using it, who are contributing. But commercially, Julia is also being deployed in production by a number of folks uh, right here. In, in New York, and uh, this was even before 1.0. So if you're on the fence about Julia, I urge you to jump in, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>